When Chuck Colson, the former hatchet man for President Nixon, repented of his sins and gave his life to Christ, several months before he pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice, and was sentenced to seven months in prison, he thought he would never do anything of importance or significance in his life again. Prior to this, Chuck had been extremely successful by the world's standards. He was the first person in his family to graduate from college, graduating from Brown University with honors. He had served in the Marine Corps as a Marine officer, achieving the rank of captain. After he got out of the Marine Corps, he went to law school at George Washington University and got his law degree. He worked in a law firm, and soon he owned a law firm. He was appointed to be the special counsel to the President of the United States by the time he was 38 years old, the youngest to ever do so at that time. Once he found himself in prison, God started to use him to transform the lives of others. He started a small Bible study of seven men that continued to multiply until the day of his release. The men he studied with did not have the same education or economic status that he had enjoyed on the outside, but in prison, they were all equal. Sinners in need of a savior, brothers in Christ. In his best-selling memoir, Born Again, Chuck wrote, I found myself increasingly drawn to the idea that God had put me in prison for a purpose, that I should do something for those I had left behind. When he got out of prison, he lived a life of gratitude for the mercy and grace God had shown him. He was determined to go back into the prisons as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and strive to live a life that was worthy of the gift of grace he had been given. Although Chuck Colson has gone to be with the Lord, the ministry he started is thriving, and his prison ministry is active in over 100 countries around the world. At our recent men's prayer breakfast that we do monthly with LifePoint Church, I heard a similar story of a local man that was one of the most powerful personal testimonies I have ever heard. Bob Kane, who gave me permission to share his story, had committed a white-collar crime. And between the time he had committed the crime and had been convicted, he had repented of his sin and committed his life to Christ. Shortly after coming, committing his life to Christ, he completed LifePoint's Freedom Curriculum, which is a 13-week training program for new believers, grounding them in six areas of personal growth. Shortly after that, finishing the, the training, Bob received a sentence of one year in the Rappahannock Regional Jail. Bob was terrified, and he was not ready for the reality of being locked up. He'd been living a comfortable life with his wife and daughter. When he arrived in prison, the reality of what he was up against hit him, and it crushed him like a ton of bricks. He was devastated. And although he had accepted Christ as his Savior, he had not completely surrendered his life to Christ. One night, he was crushed, and he prayed to God, and he totally surrendered. After that, a series of what could only be described as divine intervention occurred. He was switched from the assignment he was about to begin as a member of a road crew to working as an inmate at the Justice Academy, which trained the correction officers for the Rappahannock Jail. While he was working at the Academy, he met a couple he had known from LifePoint and had gone through the freedom training with. The couple worked at the Academy as civilians, and the couple prayed over Bob while he was there. Bob had started a Bible study prior to this with other inmates, but had no training or idea of really how to study or what to study. The in-service coordinator at the Justice Academy told Bob an FBI chaplain had given him a study Bible and told him that someday he would meet someone who needed it, and he gave it to Bob. The study Bible, a MacArthur study Bible, gave him some notes and structure to use. The Bible study grew, and it got so large that they moved his group from a small room in the prison to the prison cafeteria. As Bob's time in the prison was coming to an end, the reality was hitting him that he would soon be on the outside as a convicted felon with a wife and daughter to take care of, and he panicked again. How would he provide for his family? Who would hire him? He prayed, and he asked again for guidance. Not long after this, the position unexpectedly opened up at the Justice Academy for a civilian that would be essentially doing the same work Bob had been doing as an inmate but supervising the inmate work program at the academy. Bob had proven himself to be a model prisoner and a changed man while working at the academy, and he was offered a job. He literally walked out of prison one day in an orange jumpsuit 
and was back the following week in civilian attire with a job of benefits that would allow him to take care of his family. He was and is extremely grateful, and he knows it was God's grace and mercy that provided his salvation and his second chance in, in this life. While Chuck Colson and Bob were in prison because of their sin, Paul, who was once Saul and had been a vicious persecutor of Christians, was now a prisoner for the Lord and emphasized in his letter to the church at Ephesus what was now required for those who had been called to a life of faith. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for all that you have done for us through your Son on the cross. Help us today to hear and apply your word, to understand our worth through your sacrifice, and to live in the manner in which is worthy of the call that you have been given. Help us to do so in unity, with love and humility. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please read with me in your Bibles, turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. If you have a pew Bible, it's on page 1161. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the major of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he blessed a hope host of captives and he gave gifts to men and saying that he ascended what does it mean that he but that he also descended into the lower regions he who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things and he gave to the apostles the prophets the evangelists the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, so to the major of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be taught like children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body is joined together, and by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working together properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In the first three chapters of Ephesians, in the last couple of weeks with Krishan and Pastor John, we've been reminded that we are born into the world of sinners, and we should praise God for his blessings and mercy because of the grace he has shown us. Paul emphasizes the blessing and riches and the internal inheritance that we have received as believers in Christ, being chosen by Christ, being redeemed by Christ, and being sealed in the Holy Spirit, adopted as sons and daughters, and being reconciled to God and our former, former enemies, and have free access to the throne of grace. Earlier in the chapter, Paul told us in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that we were saved by grace through faith, not by works of our own, but as a gift from God, not as a result from works, so no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for doing good works, which God prepared us beforehand, that we should walk in them. And now as we approach chapter 4, we must respond, therefore, by walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which we are called. But can we as sinners, fallen sinners, walk in a way that is worthy of all Christ has done for us? And what is the meaning of the word worthy? And what does word, walking worthy in a manner entail? The Greek word for worthy, axios, is used as an adjective and is defined as of being of weight, of worth, deserving of, comparable to, and is the assessment of keeping with how something weighs in on God's balanced scale of truth. When Paul uses the word worthy both here in Ephesians and in Colossians 1, he emphasizes emphasizes that our outward actions should, should reflect our inward convictions. In William Hendrickson's commentary on Ephesians, he states that those who were foreordained to sonship, in Ephesians 1.5, now have the responsibility to behave in a manner in which adopted children of the Heavenly Father 
could be expected to behave, believing his teachings, trusting his promises, and obeying his will. When I was a young man and I was reaching adolescence, I was coming to the age that I was leaving my parents' house to do things outside of their supervision. My dad, a respected school teacher in the district I grew up in, a World War II veteran, he had taught for 34 years, he would pull me aside and look me in the eye. And he would tell me what was expected of a Warren man. It was, it was pretty scary because I wasn't a man yet. But he would tell me, uh, give me a list of admirable qualities that Warren men must possess. Warren mes- men must be men of integrity. Warren men must treat women as someone would treat their, their mother or sister. Warren men put in a you know, full day's work for a full day's pay. Paul is telling us not just to remember who we are, but whose we are. We can walk in a manner that is worthy because Christ has made us worthy. He's caused us to be born again, and we have new lives in Christ. Christ has made us worthy so that we now live our worthiness through love and obedience to Jesus, faithfully pursuing his will to our lives, and he will bear the fruit. He is divine, and we are the branches. He awakens the fruit by the Holy Spirit, bearing fruit and increasing in the knowledge of God. When we were called, we were called by the Holy Spirit to be conformed to the image of his Son, Prior to writing to the Ephesians, Paul made the following points in Romans. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So back to our text in verses 1 through 3, when Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We don't make ourselves worthy by doing things. This is the worldly view. We do godly things in godly ways with godly motives because God has made us in Christ. In Dane Ortland's book, Gentle and Lowly, he defines the word gentle as follows. The Greek word translated gentle can be translated as humble and meek. When these words are used to describe Jesus, they convey that that Jesus is not trigger happy, not harsh, not easily exasperated, and he is the most understanding person in the universe. The most, natural, the most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. Colossians 1.10 tells us, Thus to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, working and increasing in the knowledge of God. In Galatians, Paul tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is, what these attributes that he just described are. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is something we need to pray for daily and take self-inventory of. All of these things are attributes easily recognizable when we see them in others, but not so easy to see in ourselves if we do not intentionally commit to them. If you're anything like me and you have to drive on 95 in the morning, uh, you might get down to the second, second stoplight on Route 3, and you might have left your house thinking it was going to be a great day, but by the time you get to that second light, you're not bearing fruit when you're yelling at the guy that just cut you off, and you're about to tell him he's number one. <laughs> an example, so we should pray intentionally. An example of this would be to pray before we get in that car and drive down 95. Lord, help me to show your humility, grace, and love. Fill me with your kindness and gentleness. Help me to speak with words of grace and self-control. We must do this because of the gratitude and mercy grace has shown us and because he has called us to do so with delight and he's prepared us to do so as he stated in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We must do all of this with humility and gentleness, bearing with one another in love. So to walk in a manner that is worthy, we must first, one, recognize what he has done for us, confess our sins and submit to him. Like Bob, we must repent and completely surrender ourselves completely to Christ. Now let me pause for a moment and point out that when Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians, he was writing to those who he had known, had repented, and put their faith in Christ. 
for their salvation and were heirs of the inheritance of the grace of eternal life. I know that while most of us in here are believers, I want to make sure that I tell anyone who may be here today who has not entered into that relationship with Christ by acknowledging your sin and putting your faith in Christ to do so today if you feel called. And if you're feeling that way, I would ask you to come see myself, Pastor John, one of the elders, or one of the deacons after the service, and we'd love to talk to you about that. The second thing we must do is conduct ourselves in a way that recognizes our gratitude for the grace that God has shown us. This includes how we treat others, how we serve others, and not just hearing the word, but doing what it says, as, as stated in James 1, 22 through 23. Our greatest witness is how we conduct ourselves, displaying the qualities exemplified by Jesus. I think we've all heard the, the phrase that the greatest sermon spoken, or the greatest sermon is the one that is not spoken. An example of this would be actually giving to someone in need anonymously or showing up to help in a time of need without being asked. I've seen numerous examples of this in our church and outside the church. I saw a man in our church rally around a family that had no money for rent, and he actually gave up his rent to ensure that that family was not evicted. I work with a man who had a former co-worker who was dying with cancer in another state. He used multiple vacation days to fly out and help the man and his wife. So he would just sit with the man and talk while the wife was able to go to work or run chores or run errands that she needed to do. This is called bearing fruit. By bearing fruit, we'll be doing what we were called to do with humility and gentleness. So while the Holy Spirit enables us to do this, it, all, it also requires an effort, effort on our part. The other thing we must do is to grow in our knowledge of God through diligent study and growth. But to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ, as stated in 2 Peter 3.18. And we must mature in our faith and go from milk to meat, as the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 5.13. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for, is for, solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. One of the most impactful things that, that uh, I learned from Bob's, Bob Kane's testimony was that when he was in prison and he, he didn't have that Bible, he was hungering for the Word of God. And he had, he'd known some, some parts of Scripture and he had heard some verses of Scripture and he'd, he'd heard sermons, but he had never read a book of the Bible. And once he got that Bible, I think he told me he read through it three times in one year. And I want you to think of... Uh, how it is if you, if you have a novel, and say you just turn to page, you know, it's a 400-page novel, you turn to page 200 and you read two sentences, and then you go on your way. And then the next day, you turn to the last page and you read a few more sentences and go on your way. And then you go to the first page the next day and, it, and you read a sentence and you go on your way. You're not getting the full story. So God gave us his word to help transform us and to tell us the story of redemption from, from beginning to end. If our walk, our conduct, does not match our talk, what we profess to be, we are not being worthy of our calling. To walk with humility, love, and gentleness is to walk as Christ walked. To see ourselves as God sees us, as sinners that had no hope without his grace. In addition to walking in a manner as worthy, we must do so in unity. Paul tells us that we must be one body. This does not just happen. We must make an effort, and we must do this through the bond of peace as stated in verse 3. We must not concentrate on what divides us, but what unites us. The unity we have in Christ as believers who have been called. Verse 4 tells us there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. The church is not a mandate, but is a product of the Holy Spirit. In verses 5 through 6, where he tells us one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all, I want to emphasize that there are three persons in the triune God. He is three in one. The Father elected us, the Son redeems us, and the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. This unity is the basis for the unity that we have in the church. In verse 7, when he tells us that grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift, I want to emphasize that we've all been given gifts that contribute to the body. I think of just this service. When you, when you look at a service, you normally see the pastor and you see the music director. You think, oh, two people put this thing together, right? Right? Well, 
probably about 40 people put this service together, and they do it every week. And all the parts of the body are working together to accomplish one mission. In verses 8 through 10, Paul tells us that when he ascended, he had also descended into lower regions of the earth. Would some people debate as to whether this means he actually descended into hell or his descent was when he took on human nature? And it is one of the doctors, doctrines that can divide us if we're not careful. It's something we can disagree on but still have unity of the body, the body of believers. The most important thing to recognize is that his resurrection from the dead after the three days is what set us free as believers. Christ, who ascended for our glory, had to descend to suffer on the cross and set us free. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26, Paul emphasizes again the importance of the body working together. I won't read the whole thing, but I'm just going to read a couple of phrases. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. We were all given different abilities that could strengthen the whole body. I don't know if you watched the Olympics this summer like I did, but I, I try to watch the Olympics every time they come on. And I'm always amazed at how athletes at that level could pull every muscle of their body together to achieve what they want to accomplish. An example would be a gymnast that could sprint down a small runway, do a handspring off a pommel horse, flip three times in the air, and land perfectly. I'm like, how does it happen? Well, she's, she's disciplined herself to pull her body to do that. Or a marathon runner who can train himself or herself to, to, to run at a perfect rhythm, a perfect pace, a perfect pattern for 26 miles and look like they finished you know, jogging around the park when they were done. One of the dangers in growing in knowledge is becoming arrogant and being puffed up and believe that we are somehow better than someone else because of what we know and what we believe. There are many non-essential points of doctrine that can divide us and we can argue about. Remember, the goal of studying God's words is not just to gain information, but transformation. We don't gain knowledge so we can prove our point or win arguments. We gain knowledge in order to be transformed and then we are able to be used to assist in transforming others. There's a whole industry on YouTube of people who make videos attacking the theology of others or any denomination does not line up ex exactly with their own personal views. And while we must be grounded in the essentials and be confident of what we believe, we must also know that many sincere Bible-believing brothers and sisters in Christ will have a different view of what, what we do on many of the non not essential points of faith. I want to point out that if, you're, if you want to know the exact details of the non-essentials and the essentials of faith, there is a little pamphlet that we have in the lobby when you walk in, and you can also look it up on the EP, EPC website. I must admit, when we first started combining our men's breakfast uh, with the men from LifePoint, I was a little uncomfortable. Our church has a different culture and a different style of worship. Many of us fully, truly are the frozen chosen we don't show any emotion. The Life Point guys are completely different when we're, when we're in there worshiping and singing. They're open, they're emotional, they're vocal, they're demonstrative in their worship. They may have different styles of dress or, or expressions when singing. So the, the analogy I like to give is a lot of times when we're at that breakfast, a lot of the music is upbeat, there's electric guitars, there's drums, and the whole Presbyterian guys are like this when they're singing. The Life Point guys are like this. But we're all brothers in Christ. And the more that I have, more time I have spent with them, the more I've been convicted and impressed by their commitment, their, their, their desire to, to express their commitment, and the sincerity and enthusiasm for their faith. So we, I think, while I think it's important to, to be comfortable in the environment that you're in, that you're used to, it's also to understand that there are other people that have different environments. In our own church, I think one of the most satisfying things for me this summer is when we combine the services. In our own church, we can have, we could drift toward two cultures, the, you know, the early service where we just have contemporary music and a more relaxed atmosphere, and then this service where it's more formal. But when we combine those services uh, this summer, I think it, it, it showed a, a unity that I hadn't seen in many years. I think we should concentrate on that. It doesn't mean we have to change everything, but once in a while visit the other service or talk to other people that may have a different view than you as, as how worship should go. As Krishan stated a couple of weeks ago, 
uh, the motto of our denomination, which is actually a quote from Augustine, states unity of the essentials, liberty in the non-essentials, and all things charity or love. So in the essentials, the Trinity, the virgin birth, the work of the Holy Spirit, our depravity and total reliance on grace and forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of Jesus, all those things aren't negotiable, but the non-essentials, full immersion baptism, sprinkle baptism, types of eschatology, premillennial, postmillennial, styles of music, styles of dress, how we school our children, homeschool, public school, private school, etc. All those things are, we have liberty. But in all things charity or love, we have brothers and sisters in Christ that are all believing born-again Christians that are going to be divided on many issues. We must respect their opinions and positions with love and grace. We cannot be so divided that the world does not recognize the differences. In the final verses of this passage, we are told to become mature, to stop being infants, being tossed back and forth, and to be well grounded in our faith and live and speak our faith in love. Again, by staying in the word. And another part of our denomination that I like are the confessions, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and, and, and the tools that we have to, to, to tell us, uh, help us decide, or, or not decide, but to, to, to uh, specifically tell us what we believe. Our unity must lead to maturity, and we must grow and be solid in our faith, being able to teach others in love. In verses 11 through 14, he gave the apostles, the prophets, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So one more time, we should know the essentials of our faith and be ready to defend them. But the goal in learning should be transformation, not just information. In the last two verses, 15 and 16, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up to him who is the head in Christ. From him, the whole body joined together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does in work. Like the human body, the body of the church must operate together as one. So in order to grow in maturity, we must apply ourselves through daily Bible reading, learning, and doing. And our church has wonderful resources through adult Sunday school, care groups, and weekly Bible studies. It's very easy to get complacent, but we cannot. We must be proactive and apply ourselves. We must stay in the Word and in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us and not shrug our responsibility to grow in the body. So in conclusion... We can never walk in a way that is worthy of what Christ has done for us without grace. By grace alone we are saved. We didn't do anything to earn it, but we can show our gratitude for that grace by living in a manner, walking in a way that reflects our talk, what we profess to be followers of Jesus Christ who are all members of the same body. By walking in a manner worthy of our calling, we'll become more unified with one another. Our unity with one another will lead to maturity, Our maturity in our faith will enable us to be transformed closer to the image of Christ. So in the last 30 minutes, we have discussed Chuck Colson, Bob Kane, and the Apostle Paul. All three have incredible stories. But I want to emphasize there is only one hero in this story. It's not Chuck Colson. It's not Bob Kane. And it's not even the Apostle Paul. It's Jesus who bore our sins and took the wrath we deserve. As we leave here today... My prayer is that we will remember not just who we are, sinners with no hope without Jesus, but whose we are, adopted children of the living God, and we'll conduct ourselves accordingly. 